Good morning, good afternoon, good evening in whatever time zone you are. Welcome to this uh, webinar in our series of world-class finance on the topic of managing risk control and compliance in InforM3 MoveX. When I prepared this presentation, I thought, hmm, M3, is there any meaning behind it? Were there uh, three little stooges behind it or what was it? But I found out that it actually addresses the main industries M3 is used for, manufacturing, move and maintain. So uh, this explains a day nothing learned is a day not worth living. My name is Hans van Es and I will be the presenter for this webinar today. Um, with some housekeeping remarks up front, you will see a panel to the right of your screen where you can leave your questions. We will try to answer them if we have time at the end of the presentation. If not, we will answer them uh, directly back to you. Don't hesitate to fire off your questions. For those who don't know us, Consider Solutions, we are a organization that uh, strives to deliver solutions for world-class finance. Most mid-size and large organizations have world-class finance somehow in their plans to improve their business results, to manage their costs and cash flow, and to manage the risk that inevitably will happen when you run a business. Our footprint is quite wide and ranges from traditional compliance solutions to financial process optimization activities. And we have been doing that for years and for some very well-known household names which you might recognize on this summary slide of our customers. We are a key approver partner for well over 10 years, an official reseller of approver software in certain territories as a, uh, as a gold partner with customers throughout the world, both in North America, Europe and Asia. And we're also the organization that uh, delivers so-called Infor Micro Vertical Solutions, of which our M3 solution is one. And we have our direct approval support organization for our customers. The agenda for today is the following which you see on your screen. We do some little introductions about the um, area of interest for this webinar. We will show you how we define this market, this area and how we structure it. Then we look at how you could apply that in an Infor M3 environment. Considerations about the things you have to think of when you want to start with exceptional analytics yourself and how it can work for you. And we will close off with some entry points for a deeper dive and then answering your questions. Why are we talking about topics like this? Well. Just read the newspaper, or the uh, emails, or the the headlines in the uh, in the internet press. If you run a business, if that's a commercial business or or a governmental business, many things can go wrong. And of course, in the uh, in the headlines depicted here, you only see the big things that go wrong. But in real life, in, in many organizations. There are also a lot of many things that are going wrong and that have an impact on your business. We all group that around the notion of exceptions. Anything that happens in your organizations in a way that you didn't predict or designed as such. Uh, in while um, processing your business transactions. And the outcome of an exception can be, be anything from a non-compliance to, uh, to an audit until uh, clear indications that there is a situation of fraud 
in your organization. They all have in common that they will impact your performance as an organization. But you would say, how can we have exceptions? Because we invested heavenly in all kinds of procedures and controls, so there should not be any exception. Well, we have procedures, but procedures like depicted in this picture, uh, which can be bypassed very easily, don't give you the guarantee that every everything happens as you like. Of course, you could automate your procedures, depicted in the, the famous uh, snow track uh, image we, uh, we, uh, we often use. Uh, here, the procedure is automated, there is a barrier, and the barrier is controlled and managed, and there is a lock who goes in and out, and if your card isn't, isn't working, you can't get in. So, a sense of security. But when, when it snows, you see what actually happens. People don't take the time to find that card or left it in their trousers at home, and they just bypass your automated system. And although the log shows that the barrier works fine at the end of the month, and even you pay maintenance for it, actually your controls are not working. And then there's another thing. Our businesses and underlying systems and structures are so complex that it is virtually impossible to have controls in place for everything. Most of the times uh, there are gaps between controls or controls are, uh, are overlapping in such a way that they contradict each other even. Well, the final solution would be just to turn off the water tap. Close all potential wrongdoing in your system. Only little problem is can you do still business because your people have to have a certain freedom of usage of your applications in order to create revenue for your organization. So giving no access as, a, as the ultimate control is not the solution either. And last but not least, we can invent controls as much as we like. Humans are always smarter than systems and if they need a way, they will find a way to get out of it. Most organizations striving for world-class finance today have a foundation built based on ideas of centralization and common systems and standardization. And yes, they see financial savings from that and more predictable results and compliance. That's absolutely true. But tomorrow's demands for world-class finance go much further. Uh, elements like transparency, uh, increased customer satisfaction and the customer being part of your supply chain, uh, business, better business partnering, etc. There is a big demand for a continuous ongoing improvement in the way we look upon process controls, risks and uh, process optimization. In order to structure this rather broad topic, uh, we like to talk about the three lenses of insight. Um, we see that there are a, a number of elements grouped around financial control, let's call it compliance for argument's sake, risk assurance, risk management, and around uh, finance process optimizations you can look upon through a certain lens, either driven by external elements like SOX when you are a stock market listed organization or a Sunshine Act when you have to show transparency in, in the way you deal in your eco ecosystem. That's a lens that you can use to look upon exceptions that are happening in your organization. But lenses are not exclusive. It's not so that an exception only will fit within one lens, will be visible within one lens and will be relevant to one lens. In order to make that situation a bit more clearer, we use a model that was introduced by initially by Gardner and used by other organizations that show you a way how you can group your controls and your monitoring of them in four layers. At the top of this picture you see the stakeholders that you're dealing with, 
at the bottom you see all your systems, applications that you're working with, and in the middle you see the process, business processes. Gardner has given a four-layered model to, um, to ask yourselves questions about from top to bottom uh, how your systems are, are, are organized and, and configured and are the doors indeed closed to that system unless you have uh, access uh, that you need and, and require. Then the access to the applications itself. Can anyone access a transaction of a certain type? The level above that is the master data that is governing our business processes. Is that master data secure enough? Um, can uh, master vendor records only be changed by people who have authorization for them? And last but not least, the actual transactions that you execute in your organizations to see, okay, somebody has access to that, that was granted, this is, that is all fine, but what did that person do with that access? You could group those four uh, layers into two, uh, two main questions. Can do, which is a bit more preventive, and did do, which is a bit more detective. If we now overlay this with our three uh, lenses of insight, we get the complete picture where we say, let's look for exceptions. We do that with a certain lens in mind, but if the exception has a value for other lenses, resolving or remediating or a combination of those uh, of that uh, uh, exception will serve multiple purposes. So far, uh, a little uh, introduction in, and structuring of the world we live in. Let's now take a de more detailed look at how we can address that in M3 MoveX. Apart from, from standard issues you see with every application, uh, being an ERP or, or homegrown application, there are some elements we discovered in the M3 world which are rather specific. Uh, more than with other ERPs, we see often multiple instances within an organization, multiple versions, and, and some quite old, so you're probably quite happy with those old, old versions still. There are no standard provisioning provisions for, for managing risk control and compliance in, in M3 and standard functionality. So everything you have to do, you have to do outside of M3. Uh, to make it more complex, there are two uh, security models available. Most of the time, the organization has chosen for one, but we also, also have seen combinations, uh, yeah, especially in combination with multiple versions of M3. And last but not least, the customization effort that M3 users have undertaken is, is quite big. We haven't seen any M3 implementation that is completely and exactly the same as the one of the neighbor. It's both adding uh, additional uh, data tables and adding uh, transactions, uh, customized transactions that make every situation, every implementation rather unique. For those who don't know Approva, a very brief introduction. It's a, a very modular platform that can consume data from any ERP and or custom built system. It is residing outside the ERP environment, so no impact on the performance. It comes with a vast set of out-of-the-box uh, rules to address uh, process uh, controls, risks, and, and process optimization that you can use as a starter kit, but of course you can fully customize it to your own needs. Important is that it, it, it allows you to suppress uh, false, so-called false positives. You can find an awful lot of, uh, of uh, exceptions that have good reason because they were triggered by people working for the department, special sales, or whatever reasons. By not excluding and suppressing these, you will bombard your organization with too many exceptions that are not uh, relevant to look at, so less is more in this case. 
A very important approver has an integrated remediation workflow. So when you have found an exception, you're able to either make uh, remediate that exception yourself or hand it over to a colleague uh, or discuss that a structural change has to be uh, be made or a new control has to be added. You all can steer that with this integrated uh, workflow. A SAD approver is a, a modular solution. If I go back to our lenses and layer slide, we both look at the can-do situation, so authorizations for people that allow them to access certain transactions, and we look into the did-do situation. Did those people with those authorizations do certain things that we see outside of the wanted situation and we also regard as an exception. And we do that uh, in uh, a wide array of business processes uh, from procurement to pay, order to cash, general ledger and some specials that I will talk about later. Infor approval is now available and usable for uh, M3 uh, customers. Uh, we developed a, uh, a dedicated connector for that. It consumes data from your uh, from your M3 database and maps it to access-related data and process-related data in Approver. The access uh, data is matched against uh, access rules, and we have created a set of uh, comprising of 61 best practice rules that we standard uh, use, and they contain both segregation of duty elements and sensitive transaction access elements. Of course, if you have custom transactions built, it, those 61 rules can be augmented to cover also these custom ones. At the process side of things, transaction uh, side of things, we uh, perform the analysis against a standard uh, starter kit of, uh, of 15 rules. If you look at the starter uh, kit rules, they cover both P2P O2C and general ledger. We will see in a minute uh, the examples of them, but they are typically rules that every auditor loves, you, loves to see, uh, to be monitored, to be analyzed. And of course, you can add as many rules as you like based on existing standard M3 tables and or um, your own customized additional M3 tables. When you connect M3 with uh, Infor Approver, you will see results like this. These are some snapshots, uh, some, some overview dashboards and, and, and lists and some details, which will show you uh, when you drill down to the lowest level, the exact exception that has happened, when, by whom, and which values were involved, field values were involved. Where to start looking for exceptions? Well, apart from the preventive ones for, for access uh, control, on the transaction side, it is typically that you look for elements like this. In the procurement area, for duplicate payments, uh, in, the, in the sales uh, side of things, uh, on price changes, etc., you can see them here. And typically, uh, when organizations build this up, uh, they end up with a continuous monitoring situation covering a, a subset of these. Um, down below to the right, you see some very specific ones. If you are involved with international uh, uh, trade, and especially with uh, with goods that are uh, limited in the sense that you can't deliver them to everybody, and that can be anything from fertilizer to uh, to weaponry, of course. Then uh, looking uh, for any overt limitations in your system and and the prohibiting there is very important. So generic areas to look for and specific areas to look for. What we typically find when we use uh, Approva on the access control side of M3, uh, we, we typically find initially quite a high number of violations. 
which is logical because there was no analysis, no monitoring before. So you will see all the history that ever uh, was in there, assuming that you are looking uh, at multiple years of data. Often what you see is that uh, a whole group of people trigger the same violations because they were set up in a certain way. Uh, most of the time the, um, the, the role architecture is a bit aged and, and is not completely in line with today's business, but it was not changed for years, so that triggers a lot of uh, uh, the same violations for people with the same uh, roles. We find, of course, non-active users, more than you think. We find backdoor access, whereby there is unintended access because uh, a table is, uh, is still reachable, but not via the standard uh, role as it was defined for that user. Uh, of course, we will find IT users with all access and special situations that were created in the, in the past. And last but not least, if we're looking over multiple years, we see uh, heritage data from previous uh, MoveX M3 upgrades that were just in there and were kept in there. Typically what you will do after a, a, a first uh, access violation analysis is to fine tune, to get those false positives out. Uh, redesign of roles uh, is, is almost inevitable uh, to, uh, to completely mitigate the risk for the future. Uh, remediate where possible, mitigate by preference, uh, in, in introduce automation of compensating controls because sometimes, yes, there is a violation, but there is no sensible business way around it. For instance, if you have a little branch office with only two people, the two people have to do multiple functions, have to uh, uh, execute multiple functions, and segregation of duty is not possible there. But if you uh, apply a compensating control for that, being anything from sending an email to a regional manager and or uh, logging a, the, the activities, that can be still acceptable as a compensating control. The risk is, is still there, but you accept the risk as being part of doing business and you document via compensating control that the risk is as limited as possible. And another thing you could do is to automate your provisioning process of, of M3 uh, because uh, by doing that there is a, a smaller risk that you will create new violations for the future. If we then look at the process side of things and the exception analysis we do there, uh, first uh, on, on this slide you see the source tables that we use, you probably recognize them and uh, we map them to a, uh, a more readable structure uh, in, um, in, in, uh, in Infra Prova, which you see to the right. As I said, we use a standard uh, rule set for monitoring the uh, process exceptions listed here. Auditors indeed love, love these. If you ask an auditor which rules do you want to see, they always say, well, that and that and that, and they come up with 50 rules. But if you drill it down, essentially these rules are what, what they're looking for. Interestingly enough, it's probably also the rules that you or your, your managers uh, are interested in. And of course you can uh, say, well, I don't want to look at my general uh, ledger uh, environment or I just want to, uh, to, to look at my purchase to pay initially, that's possible. But as a, as a good starting point, uh, these uh, rules, using these rules will give, will give uh, the stakeholders um, a good return of information. What do we find typically in, when running a process exception analysis? Um, very, very different things and I tried to group them a bit in, in, in the headers of misuse, sensitivity and, and leakage. Uh, sometimes uh, they play a role in, uh, in, in all three categories. 
but you you find anything, anything from ignorance how to use the system until uh, blatant fraud and anything in between. And sometimes the uh, the effects of a uh, of an exception are found downstream. Um, a little anecdote on, uh, to illustrate that we found in a certain situation a, a very high number of sales orders that were entered with sales order lines of one cent. And then within two weeks after that, that order line was changed into zero cent. And two weeks later again in one cent and so on until the sales order was either closed with the right amounts or was deleted as not happening. We found that the, the, those exceptions and, and although in value very small and in amount very high, we put, put it on the table of the CFO and after some discussion it was found out that human uh, shrewdness in this case uh, was the, the root cause. There was a, an ERP in place with nice controls that you couldn't add a sales order line with a zero value for good reasons, but you could add it with one cent. And by giving it one cent, it would not turn up on the, the signal list for the, the sales manager that was run every two weeks. But leaving it on one cent for a longer period didn't help because after two weeks uh, they were uh, earmarked as, as sales orders too long open and they were on another signal list for that uh, sales manager. By twisting them back and forth between uh, one and, and zero cent it was prohibited that they ever surfaced. So if uh, they didn't close, nobody could complain about it. If they did uh, did close, they, they went out with a much higher value because the sales order lines normally had values of, of many euros. So large number, small amount, but big impact downstream. First of all, uh, the uh, CFO based his cash flow forecast on the information in the sales system. Yeah, assuming what would come in, a percentage of that, assuming the value in there. So he, he said, no wonder that my cash flow forecast is, is, is never correct. Second, people doing manual uh, mutations of, 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 of sales order lines without a good business reason are just wasting time. They should be uh, spending time on, on, on real sales orders and not by bypassing the system. Just as an example that the exception can be found but the root cause and the downstream effects are a matter of further analysis. Again some next steps after you've done your, your process uh, uh, exception analysis. Fine tuning, um, maybe deciding that uh, certain exceptions below a certain value are not interesting enough to uh, further look at, for instance, uh, currency differences. You might uh, see indications of potential fraud and of course you have to, to find out if it is really fraud. Redesign of processes or fine-tuning processes. Again, uh, introducing compensating controls and of course where possible uh, recuperate the revenue, cash that you lost due to the uh, exception, for instance, when you have paid an invoice twice. Approval for M3 can be delivered as you, as you like. Uh, you, you can have your own in, uh, implementation on site and run it yourself uh, up to a, uh, a SaaS uh, managed version by us. Um, you can have standard rules, optimized rules, we can completely tune it to the, the size and the needs of your organization. Um, it can work with all M3 and, and, and MoveX uh, versions, it can handle both uh, security models, uh, we can com com, uh, include any customized M3 table and or transactions, but it can also be that you have 
tables outside of M3 and transactions out of uh, M3, for instance, from other systems, uh, homegrown or other ERPs, which we can include. If you think about going exception and analytics and you want to implement uh, in for approval for that, uh, be very clear on what, what you want to do with it. Analytics is a word used a lot, misused maybe a lot. Everybody's in, interested in analytics, but you have to make clear what kind of analytics that you are doing and what it, it uh, can deliver. And you should go for the real business impact elements in that. And, and most of your managers will have, your senior managers will have KPIs in which uh, exception analysis can play a role. So make it clear to them that uh, this is not yet another thing, but that it can be integrated in their uh, daily uh, uh, tasks and commitments. And, and make sure that you uh, show them quick wins uh, where you see simple to be repaired leakage in your organization and keep also track of the value that you deliver. You have to do this in a planned fashion and, and in your plan you really need to, to address ownership, stakeholders, priorities, your goals for, for the, the different uh, areas uh, and you also have to make sure that you don't plan to implement a very nice continuous monitoring solution in your organization and you forget to, to lock the windows and the doors by uh, not changing uh, the settings in, in, in your ERP. And of course, if you uh, implement uh, a tool like Infor Approver, make sure that you optimize the use. And what you will be doing on, on, on day 100 and looking at an interest of that is probably not the same as what you're looking at day 1 and day 300. Optimize it so that it keeps delivering value for your organization. We can help you uh, uh, with that. Uh, we have a, uh, a nice methodology to uh, get agreement on the key facts with all your stakeholders and have a continuous improvement cycle around it. And of course there are some lessons uh, learned that you, in our opinion, should apply. Uh, start small. Uh, less is more. Um, there are always a handful of things that, that your key stakeholders dream about or lay awake about at night. Um, but if you find exceptions for them, and they can't be ad addressed in the organization, can't be resolved, it's useless to, uh, to monitor them because it's only frustrating that you produce uh, a large uh, quantity of information about exceptions and nobody is do doing anything with it. Um, very important is that risk and process owners who will be given the exceptions for their areas understand what you report. So make an effort to report it in such a way that it is business understandable and not um, rule technology understandable. And of course those, those process, risk and process owners should be empowered to take, take decisions and you can guide them in there, but they in the end are responsible for remediating um, and uh, mitigating um, the occurrence in the future of, of the same exception and they need to be equipped to take that action. Sometimes it's a combination, they are responsible but they need uh, uh, IT, sometimes they need you as um, exception analytics people to, um, to help them to take action. Don't forget to stay clean. It would be very frustrating if you invest a lot of time and energy and money in, uh, in, in finding th that you uh, are unclean, a lot of time and effort to, uh, to get clean and then you forget to stay clean. So make sure that there is a continuous cycle and set of procedures in place that make sure that you don't uh, introduce 
uh, the exceptions via the back door. And last but not least, always keep in mind this is a business exercise. This is not an admin exercise. It delivers business value if you, if you do it properly and it should be regarded in that way. But you have to do something for that. How could you go uh, further in the next step? If you think continuous monitoring is the way to go for your organizations, we suggest to go for an agile implementation, uh, either on-premise or monitoring as a service, whereby you quickly show uh, results to your organization and fine-tune and, and update as you learn or as you extend your scope of um, monitoring. If you're not sure yet what the value is for your organization or you can't express it in, in, in terms uh, in the right terms for your senior management, we deliver the option to run a quick scan, as we call it, where we take a slice of your data, real data, and we do a 100% analysis, so not sample based, but 100% analysis of that slice of data. And that can be, for instance, last year's data or data for, uh, for a certain region in your organization. With that, we do a, a, a complete run through of what you would do in a continuous monitoring situation. Only we do it as a one-off, just to show you the value of exception analysis. And of course, you, you get all the details of all found exceptions and all kinds of uh, options for you to recuperate uh, money that you might have lost due to those exceptions. It is giving you the arguments for your organization to say, yes, we should invest in this. And it also gives you an idea what the best way to implement is. Nothing is better than seeing real life data. I think I covered the agenda that I promised to go over with you. The area that we live in, the three lenses of insight, M3 specifics, and how it can be made working for you, and what next steps could be. And before going into answering a few questions, I want to uh, show you that the M3 user community has shown a very big interest and is promoting um, the, uh, the use of, uh, of Infor uh, Approva in their environment. This is a slide on the UK and Benelux uh, user group, what we have already been presenting to various other groups in, in Europe on this topic. Um, we have found that the M3 user groups are, are very engaged communities, and when you talk to them, uh, um, they are very happy to share their experiences and also see the advantages of applying Infra Approva in the M3 world. I think I have five minutes left to answer some questions. Let's see what came in. And the first one. How long does it take to implement a monitoring uh, environment for M3? Mm, takes a bit of a longer an answer, I guess. Of course, it depends on, on how big you are and what scope you take. Um, how many customizations you have in your system that you want to include or not. Uh, we would say that an implementation uh, duration of three months starting with requirements workshops with your stakeholders until a first productive version, that three months should suffice. If it's longer than three months, you have to rethink if your scope is maybe not too big or initially too big. It is better to have the initial results quickly and then fine-tune than to try to uh, incorporate everything in a first go. There will be um, uh, unknowns that you will only see when you start using it. 
there will be unexpected effects uh, when you uh, uh, give the information that you found to your uh, to the organization to uh, to remediate and mitigate. So, in general, I would say it should be within three months. If it is longer, there should be good arguments for it. It's better than to go for a an agile multi-version situation. I hope I answered that enough. And time for another one. Uh, what? How big should an organization using M3 be to make uh, exception analysis? A section analysis, a worthwhile exercise. Well, that's a difficult one to answer. Um, it depends a bit on, on on industry and the type of business you are doing. Uh, I generally would say it is uh, largely based on the number of transactions that you are executing on a on a yearly basis, and a transaction defined as any purchase to pay, any order to cash, any, any general ledger transaction that you execute. Because the bigger the number, the more chances are that there is uh, a lot of value in there that you can find by doing the analysis. Size and, and number of, of uh, uh, employees, the, the more employees, and the more uh, geographically spread over the world, the more likely it is that you will see advantages. Uh, revenue size, not a hard measure, uh, especially because that can uh, be interpreted very differently in in various uh, industries. Uh, if your uh, your average order order size is a, is a million, then probably a, a billion is is in the low end. If your uh, average order size is uh, 100 euros, maybe uh, 500 million could be a good good mark to go for. Uh, in summary, no hard boundaries. It, it's more a question, a discussion of um, what is what is your ambition level with this, what kind of frequencies are you looking at, and also what are you forced to do because external parties like auditors or, or, or government are forcing you to do some stuff. Uh, we are happy to talk to you about uh, uh, if, if you're if fit for it, uh, as to say, uh, based on you telling us what you um, want to achieve, then we can say, yep, this will fit or not. And of course, with uh, the choice of on-premise and, and monitoring as a service models, we can serve quite a range of organizations. I reached my 45 minutes. I have one or two questions left, but I will answer them uh, directly to the persons who fired them off. Thank you for attending this webinar. I hope it was useful. Don't hesitate to uh, get in touch with me if you have additional questions or are curious about more details. You will f see my email address on the screen. So wherever you are, have a good evening, have a good afternoon, have a brilliant uh, morning, and I hope to talk to you soon. Bye-bye.